the first Cure Ocular Melanoma or Cure OM virtual Eyes on a Cure mini summit spring updates. Even though we aren't able to be in person together this year, we are thrilled to be able to offer a number of virtual educational and networking events. This year, in addition to honoring the 25th anniversary of the Melanoma Research Foundation as an organization, we honor the 10th anniversary of the CureOM initiative. In 2006, my husband, Dr. Greg Strax, was diagnosed with ocular melanoma, and we faced many obstacles in learning about OM, as, we, uh, as well as accessing effective treatments. In a time of extremely limited information and resources for this rare form of melanoma, we became strong and persistent self-advocates in learning more and seeking the best care possible. This commitment to Greg's case soon expanded to advocacy for patients and caregivers in the wider OM community as well, which led to us joining forces with the Melanoma Research Foundation to found Cure OM in 2011. In honor of Cure OM's 10th anniversary, we wanted to bring the OM community together in more ways and provide new opportunities and resources, such as this mini summit here today. We are thankful for all of you who have taken time out of your days to be here, including our panelists for volunteering their time and giving so much to the OM community. We have two panels today. The first is the current state of clinical trials, and the second is surveillance support and the patient perspective. So I now have the privilege of introducing the moderator for our first panel today, Dr. Jason Luke. Dr. Luke is the director of the Cancer Immunotherapeutic Center at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Hillman Cancer Center. Dr. Luke specializes in early phase drug development for solid tumors, as well as the management of cutaneous oncology and melanoma. Dr. Luke directs the Translational Immunoinformatics Laboratory, which investigates large scale informatic approaches to advance cancer immunotherapy. Dr. Luke has received numerous awards, including the Melanoma Research Foundation's Humanitarian Award, as well as many other awards and research funding for his work. Dr. Luke, I'll hand it over to you, and thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much, Sarah, and uh, to everyone participating today and actually attending today um, for uh, joining us for this summit. Um, I do have the great privilege to introduce the other speakers who I think have uh, bylines and in, uh, intros that are actually much longer than mine, but for the purposes of time today, we're going to keep them a little bit concise. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Sapna Patel, who's really one of the leading medical oncologists uh, studying and treating uveal melanoma or ocular melanoma, and she's at the MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center in, in Houston. Uh, she leads the metastatic uveal melanoma uh, program there and has been a very active investigator across um, the space. And she's going to tell you actually about a clinical trial that she led uh, that I think clearly changes the standard of care just a little bit later. The second speaker is going to be Dr. Alexander Ganji from Cedar sinai uh, She's a surgical oncologist and the director of the gastrointestinal tumor program within the Department of Surgery at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. And she specializes in the surgical management of gastrointestinal tumors, uh, particularly neuroendocrine tumors, liver tumors, pancreatic tumors, and liver resections. And obviously relevant here, uh, approaches such as hepatic perfusion and management of, meta of uh, metastases from uveal melanoma. Our final speaker will be Dr. Omid Hamid, who's also from the Cedar sinai Cancer Institute and the Angeles uh, Cancer Research uh, Institute. He's the Chief of Translational Research uh, and Immunotherapy and Director of the Melanoma Therapeutics Program there. Uh, Dr. Hamid is a good friend of all of ours, and he has been one of the most active uh, investigators and physicians investigating new treatments for melanoma, specifically for uveal melanoma, and he is commonly one of our go-tos for a person who's truly in the know about what's coming next in the field, and you'll hear about some of that uh, from them today. So thank you to all of my colleagues for joining us. Uh, we will actually be addressing any questions that you might have at the end of the panel when we're hoping to reserve as much time as possible for the Q&A. So you can put your questions into the Q&A and we will be sure to look at them uh, and we'll sort of aggregate them and really then think about um, how to go about answering them for you as we transition at the end of the program. So I'm gonna take over now um, and give the first talk today um, and I'm going to just share my screen. Let's go ahead and do that. It's my email in case anybody's interested. There we go. All right. So, all right. So we'll go here and then we have to just do the flip swap and should be in business. All right. My laser pointer. So, um, 
My talk today, and I'm going to be giving the first talk, is talking about a new kind of treatment that we now have uh, for patients with uveal melanoma. Uh, and this is called T-cell redirection. And specifically, it's a drug known as Tabentafusp. And all of you will have to practice saying that because that's now the new, uh, a new standard treatment uh, for patients with advanced ocular or uveal melanoma, as you'll sometimes hear it called. So these are my disclosures over the past year or so. Uh, there are a lot of them here. You can find them online if you're interested. I work with a lot of different pharmaceutical actors uh, in terms of developing new drugs. I'll just highlight that I have been and continue to be a consultant to the company that developed this drug, Tabentafus, called Immunocore. So what are we talking about here with this concept of T-cell redirection? Um, and so uh, on a very high level, I like to explain to my patients that this treatment is really sort of almost like immunological tape, meaning that this is a drug that sort of has two sides, the two, two different things that can be uh, advantageous. So on the left-hand side here, you see a schematic of this drug called Tabentafusp. And this drug has two different parts. It has a targeting domain, meaning that it grabs stuff. And on this side, it's part of what's called a T-cell receptor. And that binds to a certain uh, peptide that's commonly uh, expressed on melanoma cells called GP100. And the other side of this molecule is connected to what we call the effector domain, which is an SCFV, part of an antibody, against a molecule called CD3. And that's an important molecule on our immune cells. And so again, one side of this molecule grabs tumor cells and the other side grabs immune cells, all right? Well, why can that matter? Well, uveal melanoma or ocular melanoma is a type of cancer which we commonly see doesn't have very many immune cells in the tumor. Uh, and what we see or, uh, in tumors when we cut them out or do a biopsy is commonly we see very little in the way of infiltration of immune cells. And that's highlighted here in these two boxes, A and C. And what you can see is after treatment with this drug, you can literally pull immune cells into the tumor as shown on the bottom panels here. Now, a really important thing to be aware of with this drug is that this targeting domain requires a certain kind of, sorry, the effector domain here, requires a certain kind of gene be present within the patient. And this isn't a good or bad gene, it's just a regular gene, sort of like your blood type called an HLA. Uh, and here we need to have HLA A2 gene for this drug to potentially be useful. So keep that in mind. So in that background, recently a clinical trial was done in which patients were either treated with this drug called Tabentafusp or they were treated with sort of what was considered regular treatment at that time. And those treatment options are listed here. I won't go through all of this except to say that patients had to have certain characteristics and they were two times more likely to get this drug than to get the regular sort of treatment. And these were the results that we saw in this clinical trial that was just recently presented at one of the major cancer meetings just a few weeks ago. In fact, treatment with Tabentafust improved the survival of patients relative to the regular treatments that were available at the time that the clinical trial was done. And up here on the top, you see this thing we call the hazard ratio. And you might think of that as how likely was it to improve the survival. And the way we calculate that is you sort of take one over the hazard ratio. So you flip this over. So this improved survival by 57%. Uh, so in cancer treatment, that's quite dramatic. And you can really see that in what we call these Kaplan-Meier plots. And this shows over time how many patients were alive after getting the treatment. And I won't go into all the details except to see, you can see there's a big difference between this blue line and this green line. So there's really no question now that Tabentafusp is going to become a standard treatment that should be available to patients basically wherever they live. Now, what about the safety of this kind of a treatment? Well, I summarized that quickly on this slide. And in the red boxes on the left, you can see those side effects, which were the most common. And those can include fevers and chills. Pyrexia is another word for fever. Fever, chills, and nausea in a substantial number of patients, as well as something called cytokine release. And that really is sort of a term we mean like immune activation. The more common side effects are these things like rash and itchiness in the skin. And the reason that we see these side effects is very much just because exactly what the drug does to fight cancer is what it does in the rest of the body. So by stimulating the immune system, you can get a lot of immune attack going on, fevers and chills, and sometimes some nausea, and can make you tired. 
as well, because this GP100 thing that the drug goes after is also present in your normal skin cells, you can also get rash and itchiness. Now, importantly, the side effect profile is really heavily present only at the beginning of the treatment. And so what you can see on the right-hand side here is that during the first week, the severe side effects are the highest or potentially the highest, but that by about after the first month, the side effect profile drops dramatically. And most patients after the first month honestly have almost no side effects. There's a little bit of a complicated dosing scheme where we increase the dose with the first few doses to get to a higher dose. And this is really actually to try to limit the side effects that we see. So in conclusion, Tibentafusp improves the overall survival of patients who have the HL8A2 genotype in advanced ocular or uveal melanoma when compared with regular treatment, which at the time of this clinical trial were drugs like nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and ipilimumab. The major side effects over the, are over the first month and then very little thereafter. And these can be rash and itchiness, fevers, chills, and fatigue. We have to test for this HLA-A2 from a blood test. And so that's a really important learning that you need to take home. It's gonna become very important that patients who have advanced uveal or ocular melanoma know whether or not their normal genes include HLA-A2. And this treatment should be considered a standard treatment for patients with advanced uveal or ocular melanoma and this HLA-A2 genotype. And don't worry if this is a little confusing, we're gonna come back to this during the Q&A and the discussion to discuss this HLA-A2 question a little bit further. So with that, I'm gonna end my talk and I'm gonna stop sharing. And in fact, I'm gonna offer and ask that uh, Dr. Patel then take over the screen at this point and move forward to discuss the results of her recent clinical trial looking at ipilimumab and nivolumab. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Luke, and to um, uh, Sarah and uh, Cure OM um, for the opportunity. Um, I'm just making sure I'm unmuted. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, as Dr. Luke mentioned, I will present uh, the phase two results of our US ipilimumab nivolumab combination treatment. And many of you guys know this treatment as basically standard of care treatment. It was approved by the FDA a number of years ago for the treatment of metastatic melanoma without any contingencies of what subtype you have to have. And so as a result, a number of uveal melanoma patients went on to receive this treatment outside of a clinical trial, which is no problem at all. But in order to objectively tell you how well it works in the population, we needed to run this trial. In fact, we'd been running, we had been running this trial for about 10 years almost. Um, these are my disclosures and relevant to this presentation, Bristol-Myers Squibb, the makers of uh, nivolumab and ibilimumab did support this study, uh, essentially with a little bit of funding and drug support. And in total, we screened 39 patients. Really, we screened every patient that came through the clinic over the first several years, um, but formally you know, went through the screening process and checked their labs on about 39 patients. 35 patients ended up receiving treatment, and then two patients um, ended up withdrawing uh, their consent. And three patients completed, and that simply means that they made it through the entire treatment period of two years without developing progression. Um, many patients did stop for toxicity while generating a response. So it was not a prerequisite to have completed the treatment. We did look at what uh, treatment these patients received prior to the IPNEVO, and it was a number of different therapies, targeted therapy, including MEK inhibitors, and in some cases, um, perhaps epigenetic modifiers, immunotherapy. Some patients had received pretreatment with some PD-1 agents or even um, other uh, immunotherapies, liver-directed therapies, chemotherapies, and then the antibody drug conjugate glumbatumumab was also um, a prior treatment. And so here are how these patients did. On the left, you see what we call a waterfall pot, plot in panel A. 
And this shows in essentially in color, if you can draw your attention to the yellow and the green bars, these are our responders. The blue patients had essentially stable disease and um, the red patients had progression of disease. There were some patients who would have technically by measurements had stable disease, but either they had progression in their non-target lesions or they had um, development of new tumors. And if you develop new tumors on treatment, even if your existing tumors are reducing, that automatically qualifies you per this criteria as uh, progression. And so we had six responders on treatment. If you look in panel B, panel B is our swimmers plot. This is essentially how long did patients stay on study? And so the um, purple uh, square, if you can see it as purple, these are patients, this is the time frame of when patients achieved their best response on study. And the red um, triangle is when they progressed. And so you can see if we just move down from the top, there were patients who had several uh, months between response and progression. Other And the tail end of that um, swimmer's plot just indicates that those patients are still alive. Um, this patient here with the partial response completed uh, or was basically on the study and has yet to progress. Um, this patient had progression, uh, best response and then progressed a little bit later. And so as you can see, only in a few patients was the progression right after their response. There were a number of patients who had meaningful responses or stability. And so on the bottom in the table, you see that of the 33 patients who are evaluable, two patients withdrew their consent and so did not have follow-up imaging to confirm um, if they did receive treatment, what was their best response. This translates into an 18% overall response rate. We did have one complete responder. It's really two, but it's the way we have defined complete response. Our, um, we have one lady whose liver tumors completely melted down. She had about small Meyer lemon, uh, not Meyer lemon, uh, key lime sized tumors in her liver, about five of them, and they just melted down very quickly. Um, ultimately, we kept biopsying the residual that we could see radiographically, and this came back as no viable melanoma, but because the radiologist could measure it, it measures as a partial response instead of a complete response. Anyway, we ultimately took her to surgery. She's a complete responder for all intents and purposes, but is not showing in the table. She's in the partial response uh, category. And then we had a third of the patients have stable disease and about half the study had progression. And so if you take a deep dive into the characteristics of these responders, sometimes people are quick to say, oh, your responders were those rare uveal melanomas that had it in their lungs only, and it wasn't in the liver. And that's just not true. Five of our six responders did have liver involvement and not a little amount of liver involvement, real liver involvement. Uh, only one patient had it in her lung and in her bone, and she was the one who was characterized as a complete response. But this first patient um, is the partial responder, and we never actually ever got to test her mutation status because we never had tumor tissue on those subsequent biopsies. So we don't know her mutation status, but we do know that she's essentially a, a complete responder as well with liver tumors. And so this is just, um, you know, just for your perusal. What's interesting is those responders typically stayed on study, you know, more than a year. There's also a question of what about side effects? If you get a side effect to this treatment, what is the effect of that toxicity on your response? And, it, and certainly there were patients, these are all patients who came off for toxicity, but actually have a survival certainly past one in two years. And their interval from their last ipinevo treatment to their next treatment is delineated, if you can see it here, by these black X's and then the purple. So this patient had a short interval from stopping study treatment and then moving on to the next treatment. This one had a little bit longer period, short, short, short. But anyway, it shows that their survival certainly continued. And this is just a, what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve. Does toxicity, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily a bad thing because you didn't have any difference in your progression-free period. And it's a little too, too small a sample size to tell us if having toxicity is necessarily a good thing. 
And then the final slide here is just what are those toxicities? As Dr. Luke mentioned with the Tebi drug, Tebentifusp, that drug has cytokine release syndrome and some very specific immune side effects, as does Ipi and Nevo. And diarrhea and your liver enzymes are the ones that would typically stop us from continuing further treatment. We would treat through itching, but we would just have to manage it. We would treat through thyroid changes, a rash, fever, et cetera. We often could even treat through adrenal insufficiency when it happened. But diarrhea and then increase in liver enzymes are the ones that of course we would watch carefully in this population. So in summary, you know, Ipinevo is active in uveal melanoma. I think we would all like to see a higher proportion of patients benefit. So a response rate of 18% is okay, and stable disease in 33% of patients is good. It certainly tells us in half of the patient population, we can derive some benefit. These results are mirrored in the Spanish trial of Ipinevo. Their study was the GEM 1402 study where they showed an 11.5% response rate in treatment naive uveal melanoma patients. The duration of treatment for the responding patients is meaningful and it's often more than a year of response. And toxicity does not prohibit generation of a response or survival. What I meant to show you in that toxicity plot is there were also a number of those patients who were our responders. We are currently doing a deep dive comparing the responders tissues to the non responders tissues trying to figure out if there's a signature present at baseline that makes this treatment a better choice for you or something we should postpone. And with that, I'll just thank the audience for your attention and questions and hand it back to Dr. Luke. Well, thanks so much. That was a really excellent talk. I think um, we're going to have an important discussion a little bit later about how we might sequence some of these treatments or when we might give some of them. But I think there's no doubt now that, that Ipi and Nevo together should be a standard treatment that's considered for these patients. So um, we're going to move on to the third talk which is gonna be from Dr. Ganji, really gonna talk about surgical management of the liver in the context of uveal or ocular melanoma metastases. So I'll let her take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Share my screen. Um, okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Dr. Selig and the Melanoma Research Foundation for allowing me to be part of this mini summit. And thanks for everyone for logging on today. So I'm going to focus a little bit on hepatic perfusion for ocular melanoma, no financial disclosures. Um, as you all know, ocular melanoma is the most common primary intraocular malignancy and about 50% of patients may develop metastatic disease to the liver um, during their disease course. Uh, current treatments for patients with liver metastasis there are many of them, they're variable. Uh, they include systemic therapies, which our last two speakers just touched upon, um, and Dr. Hamid will review again, and liver-directed therapies, which mean treatment specifically to the liver, which can include chemoembolization, radioembolization, hepatic perfusion, uh, either surgically or percutaneously, and in select patients, uh, surgery. So the, the rationale for any of these liver-directed approaches um, is that you can treat the tumors directly, frequently delivering high doses of drugs to the tumors and the liver and minimizing actual systemic toxicity. Uh, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, the liver is a pretty remarkable organ. It actually has a dual blood supply, um, receiving 70% of its blood from the portal vein or the venous system and about 30% of its blood flow from the hepatic artery. Tumors, as compared to healthy liver, obtain a majority of their blood supply from the hepatic artery as opposed to the portal vein. So the thought is um, that by directly cannulating the arteries, which is done in this demonstration with that little black thing that's going into the tumors directly, you can treat the either an entire side of the liver, a segment of the liver, or the small liver tumors directly um, by doing that while sparing actual healthy liver tissue. Now, isolated hepatic perfusion is a little bit different than those targeted um, specific liver-directed therapies. It is a liver-directed therapy, but it treats essentially the whole liver. It is a surgical procedure by which the entire liver is isolated. Um, and this is done surgically with a large incision. Um, ultimately, what happens is you can see in the image, 
that the different vessels that allow for circulation to go outside of the liver are clamped off, and then the veins and arteries that go to and from the liver are cannulated, meaning they have uh, basically straw-like canisters that are placed. And the liver is then perfused using an extracorporeal bypass system, extracorporeal meaning outside of the body for about 60 minutes. This allows for saturation of the liver with high doses of drug. Usually we use a type of chemotherapy known as melphalan. It's a pretty old drug and derives from nitrogen mustard. Um, in patients who had this procedure, the best historic data we have is that patients overall survival ranged between nine months and two years. Um, now keep in mind, this is all patients who had the procedure. We don't know the degree of disease or any other comorbid conditions. So please, any of the statistics we give you, um, you know, keep in mind that they might not be directly applicable to you. The operations are fairly complex, generally lasting about eight hours with not an insignificant amount of blood loss up to two to three liters. And then post-operatively, post patients were frequently admitted for about a week. Um, given that they had incisions, we had to control pain. And given that it's an open procedure, patients would frequently develop scarring. And so although the procedure worked, it was frequently difficult to repeat. But we knew this worked. So more recently, another option became available known as percutaneous hepatic perfusion. Um, and this is essentially the same thing, but everything is done by accessing all of the same vessels through smaller cuts in the skin. Essentially, percutaneous hepatic perfusion, or PHP, has three main steps. Uh, they involve vascular isolation of the liver with a double balloon catheter that is placed through the groin in the radiology suite, and then delivery of high concentration melphalan infused directly into the liver via the hepatic artery. Um, and then ultimately, this blood is collected from the liver, goes through a filtration system, which pulls out all of the chemotherapy, and then it's returned to the patient. In my opinion, this graphic might be a little bit easier to understand. So here you essentially have um, two catheters that are placed in the groin on each side and one catheter that's placed in the neck. Um, a large catheter that has two balloons above and below essentially goes into this vein here, um, isolates blood flow from going outside of the liver. Then the artery is cannulated and delivers chemotherapy into the liver. That chemotherapy is drained by the veins as it typically is. And then that comes back out into this catheter over here. It goes into the filtration system. This chemo filtration system pulls out all the bad things. And then your blood is actually returned to you without any of that chemotherapy. So what's, what's the data that we have for this? Keep in mind, these are again, just averages and the best numbers we have. And I'm highlighting for the more recent studies here that have had anywhere between 19 and 51 patients. Um, and there is a trial that we'll discuss and that, that data is supposed to come out at ASCO uh, this summer. So we're, we're anticipating um, I did, learning about the results of that soon. But ultimately what you can see is objective response rates for patients who had percutaneous hepatic perfusion were anywhere between 47 and 72%. Um, patients did not see progression of disease for about an average of 8 to 14 months. Um, and about over 65% of patients had uh, one-year survival, at least one-year survival rates, with median overall survivals of between 15 and 27 months. Um, looking specifically at our study uh, that included, that was the highest number of patients included today, it was about 51 patients and included patients from um, Center at Moffitt and the United Kingdom. Uh, and here you can see best overall and hepatic response rates in the entire patient population that were included. So we had a total of three patients who had complete response, complete disappearance of the tumors within their liver. A majority of patients had um, at least a partial response. Uh, and then another subset of patients had stable disease for up to six months. As is expected with all trials, some patients did not have any response to treatment. Um, anywhere between about 13% of patients had progressive disease despite treatment. How well were the treatments tolerated? Well, the most common thing that we saw were any kind of hematologic toxicity, meaning toxicity to essentially your blood counts um, or your blood system. And almost all patients had some level of anemia, which was expected. Others had drops in platelet counts and white blood cell counts, but only about a third of patients actually required any type of intervention for um, these issues. Some patients had hemorrhage or clotting 
Um, and again, a very small subset of patients required intervention. And about 20% of patients had cardiovascular toxicities that could have been related to um, abnormal heartbeats, um, chest pain, cardiac ischemias, and things of that variety. Um, few of those patients required any type of intervention, and these were typically self-limited. What about late toxicity? So how did patients feel after they went home from the hospital? Um, about one-third of patients complained of fatigue. And then next most common complaint, about 20% of patients was nausea. Uh, neither of these necessarily required any interventions for patients. Um, and one other thing that's listed here with a high percentage rate is the transaminitis. And essentially what that means is that you had high counts uh, of your liver enzymes, which in my opinion isn't really an adverse effect. It's, it's expected uh, because we just treated your liver with pretty high dose chemotherapy. And a majority of these patients had self-limited disease and improved. So the FOCUS trial, which I alluded to earlier, is a clinical trial that was multinational, multi-centered, non-randomized trial for patients with hepatic dominant ocular melanoma. And patients, if eligible, were then treated with melphalan PHP um, every six to eight weeks for at least for up to six cycles. And it was at the discretion of the treating institution and dependent on how patients uh, responded. The primary endpoint of the trial was the objective response rate. The secondary endpoints were duration of response, disease control rate, overall survival and progression-free survival. And then of course, they were also looking at the safety of the procedure, quality of life for patients and the pharmacokinetics to assess risk and benefit profiles. So to be included in the trial, patients had to have less than 50% metastatic disease to the liver. It had to be measurable by CT and MRI, and that's really for us so that we can tell if you're responding or not. If we can't see it, we can't tell you if our treatment's working. Um, if patients had disease outside the liver, it had to be fairly limited, uh, and physicians essentially had to feel that the life-threatening component was disease in the liver. Patients had to be pretty healthy um, and, and to be able to tolerate this procedure. It's essentially like doing a high interval training class of some variety. Uh, because for a period of time, your blood flow is, is diverted, at least briefly. Um, so it's a lot of stress to the heart, which is why you need good performance status. If patients had had prior chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or liver-directed therapies, that was allowed. Um, but there had to be a period of time between your last treatment and the initiation of hepatic perfusion. And if patients were receiving immunotherapy, there was an eight-week period at which you had to wait before you could have your first percutaneous hepatic perfusion. Um, not surprisingly, some patients were deemed too high risk. So if you had underlying liver disease, cirrhosis, or portal hypertension, you would not be eligible. Um, if you could not undergo general anesthesia secondary to any cardiac or pulmonary issues, basically heart or lung issues, you would not be eligible. Um, and then if patients were on immunosuppression or were on chronic blood thinners that could not be stopped, uh, that would limit your eligibility. And not surprisingly, if you had active bacterial infections that were not treated, you would not be eligible because then we would just basically be um, propagating the bacterial infection to get worse. So the, the trial recently completed accrual. And like I mentioned, we are awaiting um, final results, which will be presented at ASCO in the summer. Um, a little bird told me that the data looks really good. So that's really all I'm about to say. Um, and currently there is a expanded access program that's currently underway. And the program is planned to run, run similarly to the FOCUS trial where patients can receive up to six treatments, six to eight weeks apart, and all of the same information will be collected on patients. And ultimately this expanded access program will take place in selected trial centers in the US, uh, which will soon be determined. So in conclusion, um, well, percutaneous hepatic perfusion is well tolerated. It treats the whole liver. Uh, meaning it treats both macrometastatic visible disease that we can see and micrometastatic disease uh, that we may not actually be able to see just yet. The most common side effects are hematologic, and these are typically easily managed and resolved on their own. Um, and treatment with hepatic perfusion does not stand in the way of you receiving additional treatments if they are needed or recommended. So that's me saying thank you from my office, um, and I will turn it back over to Dr. Luke. All right, thanks so much. I think uh, I always love seeing uh, talks from surgeons with all the all the anatomy and all the different pieces connected for how complicated managing all that stuff is. It's super cool. Um, 
So um, I think one of the big questions, you know, I think that arises from the sort of evolution of data recently is how do we think about where does where do surgical approaches and hepatic perfusion sit relative to systemic therapies? And I, I think nobody knows the answer, but I'll be interested to sort of discuss that with everybody here in just a few minutes. But we'll move on to the final talk, which is from Dr. Um, Omid Hamid, who's a leader in drug development um, and a real uh, expert in this space. And so I'll let him take it away and let us know about kind of what's on the horizon and what's coming. Sorry about that. Let me, let's get going here. So I'm Ahmed Hamid. I'm a medical oncologist at the Angeles Clinic and Research Institute, which is a Cedar sinai affiliate. And today I'm just going to be talking about what's upcoming, what's going on. I think one of the most important points that came from the discussion today was the fact that there is um, that there is not a lot of, uh, uh, there was not a lot of information and resources in the past. And that is really changed these days as it relates to uh, clinical trials for uh, ocular melanoma. I will say that, let's see if we can get this going. These are my disclosures. These are my disclosures. Again, the more disclosures you have, the more balanced the talk. What I'm going to do today is just talk about some trials that are upcoming and do it in a quick fashion to show you that, you know, when you look at my initial sign here, these are pretty much patients with ocular melanoma walking in the door. And there's always been a bouncer that said, you know, the exclusion for this melanoma trial is ocular melanoma. The exclusion is ocular melanoma. And that's not what's happening these days. These days, Ocular melanoma has been shown to be a immune uh, manipulative tumor, and therefore, what we're seeing from what we're seeing from uh, cutaneous melanoma data and other solid tumors is being taken. So this is what I'm going to show here. Uh, Dr. Luke talked about the bispecific from immunocore called Tabentafus and how it brings the T cell and the cancer cell together, as you can see in the upper right corner. Uh, but also we know that the PRAME protein is related to poorer prognosis in ocular melanoma. What I want to talk about and the way I look at these bispecifics are either a double-sided plunger, bringing these two cells together, or for the Jewish people like me, uh, a matchmaker, brings the T cell together to the cancer cell. And this is another trial where we're accruing in a phase one fashion, similarly to what we did with Tependafus, patients who are HLA-2 positive and express, uh, express the PRAME protein. So let's say you've had Tabentafus and it hasn't been beneficial. This is available for your, if in evo, uh, it hasn't been beneficial, you, this is available for you. What we've also seen is the ability of these newer checkpoints, uh, whether they're inhibitory, like the TIM3, LAG3 or CTLA4PD1, or they turn up the activation, these being brought further in after some of the data we've had here that shows the benefits of CTLA4 and PD1 in ocular melanoma. So this is, as you can see here, the, the title up there is the hottest data in cutaneous melanoma where LAG3 with relatlimab has shown benefit in progression-free survival in cutaneous melanoma. Well, We've known that LAG3 and TIM3 are overexpressed in tumors that uh, have become resistant to immunotherapy. Down here, this is Paula Asierta's data in PD1 refractory uh, cutaneous melanoma. Well, we've also known that LAG3 is overexpressed in ocular melanomas. And what I show you here are two trials that are ongoing. This one is a phase one trial at our site and multiple sites. This one is. Uh, Dr. Jose Lutsky's trial in Miami, uh, adding LAG3 uh, to PD-1. So these are coming, and we'll see how it goes. But again, as an aside, the one below adds TIM3 and LAG3 to those patients who had PD-1 therapy, including CTLA-4 and PD-1, and were refractory. Uh, going from 
from what we've learned from lung cancer. Roche had a TIGIT antibody uh, that showed better progression-free survival and response in patients with lung cancer. Well, you say, well, where is that coming for us? Why can't we have those things? Well, this is a trial from Moreo Biopharma that's taking patients who have failed initial immunotherapy and allowing them, you can see down here, rare tumors, uveal melanoma, to have a PD-1 plus a TIGIT, and we see where that works for our patients. Clearly, we've all seen the data from, uh, oops, go back. We've all seen the data that's come from adoptive T-cell therapy, and that is where we excise the tumor. That's where we need our surgical oncologists like Dr. Ganji. We plate the tumor, we culture, and grow the T cells that are specific for the tumor itself and reinfuse post chemotherapeutic lymphodepletion. That is taking the fighters, increasing that army, and giving it back to the patient. This, this data is at the FDA now for patients with cutaneous melanoma that have progressed on PD1 therapy, where we've seen good responses and good benefit. But I'll bring your attention to data that's ongoing in cl clinical trials that are looking at it in metastatic uveal melanoma, showing am amazing disease control. You can see down here a patient with a complete response 20 months through. And if you follow the ye uh, yellow, orange, if you follow the orange, you can see these are checkpoint refractory patients. So more data to come from this in, in the meetings that are upcoming. But what I want to say to you is that not only have we come up with standards, but we're coming up with improvements to the standards and we're bringing the data previously thought not to be responsible for benefit in uveal melanoma to uveal melanoma with evidence of benefit. Uh, this is the ipilimumab and nivolumab data that was just presented by Dr. Patel, but I will say that we're looking at novel ways to improve the immune stimulation in the liver, uh, and that these novel ways can uh, move on to uh, this new thought, which is tumor-targeted fields. Uh, this is Novacure, which runs a, a current through the tumor. And you would say, well, that sounds like, what? But this has shown benefit in uh, glioblastoma, which are brain tumors, mesotheliomas, which are tumors of the linings of the lungs, and they've become standard to give this along with chemotherapy, to give this along with standard therapies. And we can see that when you give these tumor treatment fields, uh, this is a kidney tumor in a rat, but you can show increased immune cell infiltration. And where does that go? Uh, Justin Moser, who's at Honor Health and uh, sees melanoma there, is working on a trial that would take tumor treatment fields, and give it along with ipilimumab and nivolumab. So moving forward and improving what's standard. We know that liver metastases are poor for immunotherapy. Uh, there are multiple presentations, and I just put this article up there to so show that this is a focus of our, of our immunotherapeutic development, not just for uveal melanoma or uh, uh, metastatic cutaneous melanoma, but for all solid tumors. And we've shown that liver metastases lead to poorer prognosis in cutaneous melanoma and uh, non-small cell lung cancer. How can we benefit this? Well, there are a bunch of ways, either if it's with radiation, as Dr. Luke has presented, whether it's with tumor treatment fields, or now some of these injectables uh, like uh, TVEC, oncolytic therapies, virus therapies that carry a payload. And this is data presented at ASCO recently of injecting this TVEC, which is a herpetic virus that codes for an immune drug into tumors. And this was for hepatocellular tumor or those with liver metastases and showing that you can control disease and you can possibly improve the immune response. Why do I say that? Well, if you go to MD Anderson and you go to UPMC or the Angeles Clinic or X, Y, and Z place, we have multiple trials that are looking at direct visceral injection, which means into organs like the liver, and will allow patients with uh, uveal melanoma. We've done that here. 
and other places are doing that. Uh, epigenetic therapy is involved in changing the way that your DNA is methylated. Uh, this is a lot here for you to take in, but just to, to know that when your DNA changes, you know, your DNA, as you can see in the upper left, is coiled a lot around proteins called histones, and those come together to make nucleosomes, and those becomes a chromatin in your DNA. But by changing the sugars that are on there, you can change a malignant cell to a non-malignant cell. EZH2 inhibitors are uh, approved and available for lymphomas, but we have multiple trials looking at these as targets for uh, metastatic uveal melanoma. So as we come to an end, I think what I really wanted was not to educate you on how these pathways work, but to just give you the understanding that the field of therapeutics for ocular melanoma is exploding, that we have a huge amount of optimism for what we can do here. And if you look on the top, there's my office in the top left, Dr. Ganji's office. But the fact that every one of us are now working together in virtual clinics, no matter where we are, to improve the outcome for patients with uveal melanoma. Thank you. All right. Well, that was a fantastic overview. I think it's just um, so much going on in the field right now. I can't emphasize enough that uh, really it is a hopeful time um, and a lot that potentially could bring the field forward. So as we go into the Q&A here, I think we have about 10-ish, 12 minutes here. And so um, I wanted to start by just <laughs> clarifying um, one, one point about Tibentifus, uh, the T-cell redirection drug that I had mentioned, because I think um, I tried to say it, but I think it isn't clear enough. We need to do a blood test before you would be considered for that treatment to check whether or not the HLA-A201 gene is present. Okay. And many people asked, uh, well, how common is that? Well, it turns out it's about 50, 50, or maybe slightly less in Caucasians and white people. It's lower than that in other ethnicities. So that's a really important point here because it is not at all the case that these treatments are necessarily exclusionary of each other. And they're not all actually the best for each person. And I think that's going to be a reoccurring theme. So I want to just make that point, but then maybe pitch it over to Dr. Patel and just ask very straightforwardly. Now that we have, you know, now we have these three different modalities we discussed with Tebby, with Ibinevo, with hepatic directed therapy. How do you think about that for a patient who comes to you who, you know, is thinking about their first treatment or how do you set that sort of, how, how in your mind are you thinking through that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. If you have so many options, what is the sequence? And I don't think it's a one size fits all for everybody. I like to look, I like to let the tumor biopsy guide me. So in other words, we would take the tumor tissue and we would actually look to see, has the immune system already started trafficking? In other words, maybe you just need a little bit of ipinevo to, to push it along. If there's no immune system there, maybe something like this double plunger molecule to Bentifus might help, or if it's really um, a tumor that just doesn't look like it's got anything happening, maybe that's where something like liver directed, you know, uh, arterial infusion, embolization, or the percutaneous hepatic perfusion, these, or even intratumoral agents, what these things do is help sort of crack open uh, a tumor, a dead tumor, um, it kills it and then it cracks open the tumor, and then your immune system System can come do the work. So it's really not the same for every patient. I have found you cannot tell by the scan, the size of the tumors, the location, or the patient-specific characteristics, male, female, age, whatever, if they're going to respond or not to a certain treatment. So I like to let that tumor biopsy guide me, which is why many times when somebody comes I might actually repeat the tumor biopsy just to get a chunkier sample or a specimen instead of that sort of liquid aspiration. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are great points. And I think, I think everybody, I'd appreciate your input as we sort of talk through this. The question I was going to ask for Dr. Ganji is, could you be a little more specific or um, sort of discuss a little bit about what, how do you evaluate who is a good candidate for getting hepatic perfusion? Because um, I think it's the case that not all patients actually sometimes are not good candidates, and that can be because they may have other illnesses or the tumor, though, may actually have certain, be taking up too much of the liver. Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? And maybe then also to the, how would you think about what sequence you would want to give these treatments in? 
Yeah, so I'll answer the second question first. Um, I think I, I agree with what you've mentioned and with Dr. Patel, what she's mentioned. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we know the optimal sequence in which to treat um, this disease necessarily. And I think it's, it's a very patient directed approach depending on how patients are responding to different treatments that may, they may have already had. Um, and I think, um, as we all know, it's really important to have a, a good team of people treating you, including interventional radiology, medical oncology, surgery, so that we can basically look at the patient, look at what's going on and say, this, is, this might be the optimal way to treat you, which is the polar opposite of how we're treating someone else. Um, so I think that's important. In terms of evaluation for percutaneous hepatic perfusion, I mean, historically, we know that patients who have uh, almost predominant replacement of the liver by liver tumors are not good candidates because there's really only so much that this chemosaturation mechanism um, can do to provide a treatment to the liver. So typically, we, we think that patients who have less than 50% disease replacement tend to do better. It doesn't matter if it's on both sides of the liver or single side. Um, so essentially those are qualifications from the burden of liver disease that we look for. And then, as I mentioned, patients have to be fairly healthy because this is, this is pretty high interval training in order to do the procedure with isolation right. of the liver and extracorporeal. So um, some patients just don't qualify. They may have very limited liver disease, but they may not actually qualify for percutaneous hepatic perfusion because their, their heart may not be able to tolerate that. Um, and in those patients, then you can look at um, injection therapies, you could look at intra-arterial therapies, which don't have that same type of overall systemic stress. Um, but it's kind of looking at the whole patient and looking at your disease and, and deciding what might be right for you. Yeah. And so Dr. Uh, Hamid, do you want to pick up on that? And I think maybe take that theme forward about evaluating patients for the right treatment, because one thing that I, I perhaps undersold a little bit is that while rare, it is possible with Tabentafus, and I know you, you've been uh, one of the leaders of that program for since the beginning, to, to get sort of extreme you know, cardiovascular-like effects. And so are there patients that you would think are you know, perhaps you know, maybe not the best patients to treat with that, or do you kind of think we'll figure it out as we go? Yeah, so I think we've all become more, more familiar with how to treat cytokine release through what's been going on through the pandemic and, and all that. It's just the ability to identify it. One of the issues with Tabentafus, where coming to a clinic near you is the need for overnight evaluation and uh, uh, hospitalization, and then for the first couple of times as you dose up. Uh, but I think it's really good for everyone. We've treated patients of ev every age and ethnicity and, and sex. Uh, what's interesting for us is the data that's come uh, just by treating patients. So Rick uh, Richard Carvajal has a patient who got a uh, checkpoint inhibitor, didn't respond, went on to Tabentafus, and then had a slow progression, and then ultimately got uh, checkpoint inhibitor again and had a phenomenal response. So there's evidence there that you have reignited the immune system. So I look forward to some of the data that comes from uh, some of the initial trials we did. There was a trial in uh, cut uh, cutaneous melanoma where it was Tabentafus, CTLA4, PDL1. So uh, I, I think it's for the what we've said here is a, a work in progress. Um, there are some patients who really have no time to wait or don't have the ability to tolerate either of the therapies if there is a toxicity. Um, I don't think you're wrong to go one or the other. If I had my choice, I would start with the one that has a randomized trial and survival benefit um, in this at this time also to Bentefus is available through uh, compassionate access to some pa uh, to patients through uh, places that are familiar with it. It still has a washout. So you can start with Tabentafus if you get backed up, go into a checkpoint combination without any delay. Yeah, so good points on that. I, I caught an eye, there was just the last comment I wanted to just note, and uh, someone asked about coverage for incidental things when one tries to participate in a trial, like travel, hotel, food, et cetera. I think that's just a really important point that as uh, clinical investigators, we don't always emphasize enough that, that that question varies a lot. 
And so the extent to which there's potential to go to find a trial versus whatever, that's really something you got to think about with you and your family in terms of what would it mean and what would that be? Because the answer is maybe kind of sort of. Sometimes there is support, but sometimes there isn't. Um, and so considering all those factors beyond just like how exciting is a drug or what would it really mean to participate in a trial is really, really important. Um, I did want to throw back to Dr. Patel quickly about this idea of combining. You answered actually in the chat, but someone asked about doing hepatic perfusion with Ipinevo. And do you want to speak to just experience with that? I mean, obviously there are clinical trials that are doing that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've done it with um, more commonly would say like an ablative maneuver, maybe a radiofrequency ablation or a um, uh, uh, investigational therapeutic called PV10. I actually really like that strategy. I think that's a way it, we say this sort of colloquially to make a cold tumor maybe hot. So a tumor that doesn't have the immune system floating around it, it, it might be a way to drive it in. It doesn't always work. It's not always, you know, a slam dunk, but in somebody in whom it being Evo right away may not be useful, combining it in, in that sort of rationale may make sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I certainly would agree. And I've done done that quite a bit too in my, in my practice. Um, you know, one other area I want to just touch on was the idea of um, uh, not, not stating that everyone needs to do this, but the possibility around second opinions in sort of expert disease areas, right? So we, I think all three of the groups here have focused uveal melanoma specific research programs and treatment paradigms. But I think to Dr. Ganji and Dr. Hamid, maybe from both sides, from the surgical and med onc, do you want to speak to that, that, that utility of, of getting an expert opinion <laughs> about, um, you know, what, what, what does that extra add in terms of both knowledge and maybe comfort level that people might seek? Yeah, I, I think the, the most important portion here is to state that we want to work with your oncologist in order to build an infrastructure of care. So a therapeutic plan does not mean what you're getting now. It means what are you eligible for if you need it right away later? And how can we bring those things together? And how can we help move patients to the right therapy locally and help their physicians through uh, forks in the road that may come in their care? Mm -hmm. So I am a big believer in a multidisciplinary care program that brings the primary oncologist on board. And so you get a consult initially, we say, go back, get it, Benevo, go back, get this therapy that's available. We can tell you what's in your area, how to begin and how to work together. And then we can pull an HLA if we need to. Some people, this is new information that most sure. oncologists are not aware of. Sure. And so we can get that ready and know down the line whether Tabentafus is an option or not. You can see a person who uh, needs a new therapy having to be delayed for five to 10 business days until an HLA comes back. That's important time. Sure. And Dr. Ganji, do you want to make any quick comment on that or final comment on Uville? We're almost at the top of the hour. No, I mean, I think I essentially agree, but I think second opinions and going to expert centers, uh, really the goal is, is for collaboration. And I think if, you know, if there's something that we're unable to offer that we know another center has, then we try to work together to guide the patient to go to a different institution or a different physician, whether it be a surgeon or a medical oncologist to get what they need. So I think um, second opinions, I, I don't feel ever hurt uh, and I think can only be beneficial. Sure. Well, that's great. And so I'd like to thank uh, all the uh, panelists here for some great talks and great information. Um, obviously, CureOM and the MRF are tremendous resources. They're the go-to place that I send all my patients. I'm like, if you're going to go online, go to the MRF, all right? But uh, I don't want to run over because I know there's another panel coming up just next. So I'm going to pass it back to our hosts from the MRF and just say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. And best of luck. Uh, and let us know if we can help. <laughs>